places. People. History. Culture. Art. The Seven Seas. An ECU student production. Hi, I'm Anthony Sherrod. I uh, would like to thank you for joining us on the, this, our season finale of the show, The Seven Seas. The show where we explore and discuss the various and diverse cultures that encompass Pirate Nation. We end our journey in the great state of North Carolina. We're joined, we'll be joined by a special guest, Dr. Tom Shields, a professor of early in American literature, who will give us his insight on uh, literature as it is represented through North Carolina history. Our second guest will be Miss Lisa Beth Robinson, who is a letterpress printer and book artist who will educate us on ledger printing as it is represented here in North Carolina. And our last guest, special guest, a local musician, uh, I'm Todd Barcelou, who will uh, play a tune for us on the banjo. Dr. Tom Shields, we thank you for joining us. So you have a degree in, in literature, mm -hmm. and we're here to discuss no, no, um, North Carolina literature. Right. Are throughout the three regions of North Carolina, how is uh, literature uh, portrayed throughout the two, three regions? Well, um, it's important to think about North Carolina in those three regions that there's kind of, and there's some nice dividers. There's, uh, if you go east of 95, you've got the coastal plains, uh, then the Piedmont, and the, that's the Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, Charlotte area, and then the mountains. And the geography of each of them affects what people can write about them. Uh, Eastern North Carolina has uh, the kind of longest literary tradition uh, going back to the colonial days. And so we have people like John Lawson first writing about North Carolina, uh, one of the first people in print to call it North Carolina rather than just Carolina in 1709. And then you've got the whole kind of, North Carolina is not a big urban state. It does have some urban centers, but you get some more of that in the Piedmont, but then rolling hills in a different kind of area that's going to be portrayed there. And then mountains, of course, have its own culture uh, that come along, and so that that's portrayed differently there. And so you get different writers from the different regions that, that will do that, um, and in different periods. So yeah, it's very much the geography of the state affects what people can write about if they're writing about North Carolina. And really, um, how, does, how does, what characteristics distinguish each region? It's really in the eastern part. It is the uh, you know, well, we're flat um, <laughs> and that uh, and and very agricultural. Um, plus two, then the populations that come out of that history and that background, so that uh, the largest um, African American populations in the state are in the eastern part of the state. We even have the only uh, African American majority counties in the eastern part of the state. So you get more of that portrayed in eastern North Carolina. Um, and uh, then if you get out to the mountains, there's not a large uh, African-American population, but we have uh, Cherokee Indians out there. Uh, and so we get that kind of mix of combination. The center part of the state, uh, there's some, uh, I wish I could think of her name, there's uh, some up and coming uh, uh, Vietnamese writers, because that's where people are tending to migrate to at this point. Um, so we're getting those kinds of representations in, more in the central part of the state, in the, in the, uh, the Piedmont, with yeah, the, 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 the uh, Chapel Hill, Raleigh-Durham area, and the Charlotte area attracting certain populations in that way. So um, each of them has, who, who have they attracted and where did that come? So we get even early plantation novels uh, in the eastern part of the state, but we also get um, portrayals of, uh, and darn if the name isn't escaping me, but uh, uh, African-American writer who actually teaches up at Chapel Hill. This is one of those cases where you can tell the person's life story but can't remember the name. Um, but uh, grew up in uh, the Chinkapin area in, in southeastern uh, North Carolina writing about being black and coming out of there and being gay and what is it like going back to that small community uh, with grandmother's church and things like that. So 
who you are, the, the area, the ruralness of it, uh, the separateness of it, but also then the population that comes with it. Um, going back to the history, because this is where plantation could be, really kind of affects that sort of thing. And really the different transitions through time. Exactly. Um, and North Carolina played a pivotal role mm -hmm. uh, during the Civil War. Right. Uh, how is Civil um, War literature uh, represented here in North Carolina? One of my favorites that way uh, is, uh, was edited by the, uh, the late, uh, um, put out in an edition by the, uh, the late uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Keith Sparrow, um, which was uh, some pieces about uh, several little short novelettes by Confederate soldiers portraying then um, what was it like to be a soldier in, Eastern North, in North Carolina at that point. Um, and so these become absolutely what we don't expect in these kinds in novels at this point. Here, who are the good guys? But the Confederate soldiers. The evil outsiders are the Union soldiers who come in, and they are portrayed almost like um, the uh, the kind of uh, oh, say financial barons of today. Um, they're coming in. It's all self-serving. They're not really there for any good kind of purpose in that way. Uh, and so, yeah, we get this kind of portrayal in the in the literature. But what's so interesting is what's underlying that in North Carolina is that uh, not all of North Carolina wanted to go with the South. Uh, the mountains, and this is again that geography, the mountains saw themselves much more connected with the North, North. and Union and remained there. Um, what was pushing this kind of evil uh, sort of uh, Yankee during the war uh, in the East was that the coastline was pretty well taken by, uh, by the Union so that we have uh, Roanoke Island having Union camps on it in that way. So somebody who's writing, say, from Edenton in that area sees that too close and starts to portray it. So that was definitely that a different perception between the uh, different regions exactly. and that was portrayed exactly. throughout the books. But what? even, uh, well, and there's one more kind of literature we often forget, which is the not published stuff, but the way people wrote their own materials. Uh, a graduate student of mine several years ago, Taylor Lee, did an uh, edition of a collection of letters from somebody from the, from the Piedmont, from the kind of Greensboro area. And he went in the, uh, and, and if you read his letters together, they create his story he went in to take, uh, uh, somebody had been drafted and he was going to take their place for money and thought the war would be over quickly. And his idea of the war is just, how bad does this, could this be? And writing back to home to his wife about how everything's going wrong and how he knows everything home is going wrong. So, yeah, it's. That, that really sounds like a fascinating drama yeah. citation. I'll have to take a look at it. Yeah. Well, um, Dr. Shields, mm -hmm. we thank you for joining us. Yeah. And um, now we're going to uh, cut to a see what ECU students know about North Carolina in our last edition of Global IQ. The capital is Raleigh. <laughs> I think the Wright brothers were from North Carolina. This is the state of first flight. I know that this, there was a small slave port in Wilmington and that there's a plantation house on Highway 43 on the way to Emerald Isle. They are focused a lot on church. We like fried food. Uh, we like uh, big trucks and uh, some southern flags. A lot of fried chicken. Um, <laughs> Collard greens, which I don't have back at home. Um, biscuits, grits. We thank you for tuning back in with us. We're now joined by Miss Lisa Beth Robinson, a letterpress printer and book artist. Thank you for joining us. Now, North Carolina is a state rich in um, art and cultural opportunities. Um, what uh, opportunities are available here in letterpress printing? Uh, there are actually quite a few, um, pretty much from east to west. From On the east side of the state, it's more private printers, uh, where on the west side of the state, there are a lot of classes and workshops. There are schools of craft. But the individual press movement is huge. And we had our first Ladies of Letterpress conference in Asheville, which was organized actually by um, two people, one of whom is an ECU alumna in August of this past year, and I was lucky enough to be a presenter there. 
How does um, art um, letter press printing um, inf uh, contribute to the community? I think people are used to seeing it contribute as literally a business, a product. But when you make a piece that shows someone an embodiment of language, when if you imagined every word that you and I are speaking and it was printed on a page and then as the maker I get to choose the typeface and the paper that's printed on and the colors and any images that might go with it, you, the language changes and you make in a way, you make things richer by producing a piece through that you've directed and given to someone as a gift. It reframes the way the viewer sees the world just by something as simple as printing it. You sound really passionate. I'm a little excited, yeah. <laughs> so um, what other um, features are translated um, through your artwork as far as um, emotion, uh, landscape, um, encounters with people you've met? Oh gosh, many, many. Um, I also make my own paper, so where I live, yeah, where I live is very important to me. The plants that I use, the fibers that I choose, um, my work also uses a lot of seeds in it, not like the county fair, although <laughs> it was a big influence. But the materials around me become the voice and they become that language. A lot of the work that I do revolves around um, selecting a printed text and then obscuring the language to bring other stories and narratives forward. So the, the materials that I use from the landscape and even the colors and the influences um, change the way my artwork develops. Like I've noticed since I've lived here, even though I lived in California, I wasn't near the ocean, I was in the mountains. And since I've come here, my paper seems to have more um, like sand colors and watercolors and hues. The sky is different here, so the, even those hues change. So where in North Carolina um, can interested um, patrons go to uh, view some of your work or work from other renowned um, letter first printers? That's a good question. Um, I would start with Penland School of Art and Craft, or excuse me, School of Crafts on the west side of the state. They can also take letterpress classes there. That's a um, that's pretty much where a lot of artists want to go when they die because it's better than heaven. Uh, oh my God, it's incredible. <laughs> they have everything. They have, you know, they have letterpress, they have paper making, they have print making, glass, textiles, iron, wood, clay, metals. Um, they have big, you know, large and small. Um, that would be a place. If you want to go closer to the triangle, there are a lot of individuals who are teaching. There's a really great guy named Brian Allen who's teaching right out of his own shop. Um, I don't teach classes, but usually whenever I meet printers, especially fledgling printers, um, I'm more than happy to open my shop if they're serious about the craft. I don't, you know, I'm busy. I don't want to screw around with somebody who just wants to play games. Really? But you can also take classes at ECU. Uh, Craig Malmrose is teaching letterpress right now. Really? It sounds like you're um, really passionate so. about your work, and I'm sure others would uh, find it enjoyable to witness some of your work. Well, um, <laughs> Ms. Robinson, we thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, we'll be right back at a brief um, PSA break. And we're back with our final guest, um, local musical talent, Todd Barcelo. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I see you here with the banjo. Uh, what first introduced you to the banjo? Well, uh, I was introduced upon a band uh, called the Abbott Brothers. Uh, and Scott Abbott, the lead musician and like singer in the band, he graduated from East Carolina. And uh, I was really interested in the stuff that the band was doing and how popular they were getting in the music. And, Scott Abbott actually plays the banjo in most of his songs, and they're very bluegrass, like North Carolina uh, oriented. And with their newfound passion, you helped co found your own band, West End Revival, mm -hmm. uh, which plays uh, bluegrass rock. But my question is why the banjo over the guitar? Oh, why the banjo over the guitar? Um, at least for now, or 
for now, it's because uh, the, the banjo is so intricate compared to a guitar, and uh, in the band I'm playing in, we like we need that uh, compared to a guitar who does like just rhythm for now at least. So I like the complexity and just like the subtleties at the same time that the banjo brings compared to uh, something that the guitar would have. So is the so the banjo is centric to bluegrass um, rock? Uh, yes, definitely. The banjo or bluegrass wouldn't be nearly the same without the banjo. Really. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've played around um, North Carolina? Yes, uh, my band, West End Revival, plays shows in Greenville all the time, and we've played in Chapel Hill and Greensboro and uh, even Asheville. Really? Mm -hmm. So how is the reception, um, say, from maybe Asheville to Greenville? Um, in Asheville, I feel like they're more used to the music mm -hmm. that we play. So like they enjoy it more, and uh, they seem to get into it, and they know how to dance to the music compared to, like, playing in some like big bars in Raleigh. Like some people there that might stand around, but in Asheville they're more likely to like dance, dance with us on stage. Really? So what are some features of uh to dancing to uh the banjo? Um I mean I don't know really how to answer that. Uh it's just you know, you you had to you have to feel the music. You have to you have to feel the beat just like any other song, except uh with uh, I don't there's some complex rhythms and like stuff with timing that the banjo and other instruments do in bluegrass that isn't commonly found in other music. And um, I understand you have a little tune to play for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna play the opening to one of the songs we have uh, on our album. All right. Beautiful. Well, we thank you for joining us, and we wish you all uh, more continued success. All right. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back after another brief break. We'd like to thank everyone for tuning in um, throughout the entire season of Seven Seas. It's really been a pleasure um, educating and learning uh, about different um, diversity and cultures around the world as they are portrayed here um, or represented here um, on the great campus of ECU. Uh, we really just like to thank you for tuning in and um, it's been a pleasure.